Hey everybody, welcome back to The Bitcoin Show. As you know, I'm Bruce Wagner and uh, we are so glad you joined us. Today we're going to talk about, we have a major announcement from a, a new exchange site, not that new, but um, maybe little heard of, called bitfloor.com and they have a major announcement of new technology they're rolling out today. So stay tuned. Today's episode of The Bitcoin Show is brought to you by BitcoinMe.com. It's basically the Bitcoin for Dummies site. It explains what is a Bitcoin, how to use it, why to use it. So tell all your friends, when you tell them about Bitcoin, tell them to check out BitcoinMe.com. There's also a Buy tab that teaches you how people buy Bitcoin. And there's an Accept tab to teach you how to accept Bitcoin as a merchant. And Shopping tab to show you all the places you can shop with Bitcoin. Hey everybody, we're back. So, uh, joining me today is Roman Steilman. Did I say your name right? Stillman. Yes. Stillman. Oh, I practice it and everything. <laughs> Stillman. It's S H T Y L M A N. Okay. Yes. Stillman. It's not easy to say. It's right. <laughs> a tongue twister. Yeah. Bit floor is easier to say. Much easier. Okay. So tell us, uh, Roman. Now, now you're my neighbor. Right? We live like nearby, right here right. in Midtown Manhattan. So. Um, uh, I've known about BitFloor kind of since the beginning because we met actually. Did was the first time we met at the Bitcoin conference last August? Yes, okay. in New York. Yep. Okay, right here. It was. All right. mm -hmm. And I remember meeting you, and and I remember you saying that uh, we're gonna. My friend and I are gonna start a Bitcoin exchange. And I was like, that's exactly. Oh, right. okay. I mean, that was like one of the first things I heard you say. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, who who are these kids? I mean, because I thought you you know. You looked like a lot younger than you are, by the way, which is a good thing, actually. Yeah. You'll appreciate that later. <laughs> but um, I thought, oh my gosh, okay, that's cool. Good for you. You know, the more the better. But since then, you've launched it, and uh, I've been hearing fantastic things about Bitcoin. When did you actually, I mean, BitFloor, when did you actually launch BitFloor? Uh, I believe it was l November when we actually pushed out to production um, and allowed people to start depositing real funds and real, you know, Bitcoin, real U.S. dollar. Uh, before that, we had the test net running, which just lets you, you know, use fake mm -hmm. currencies and, Buy and you know, yeah, figure currency. out what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it was November, around that time frame. November. So when you started working on it, was it in August or September? Yeah, it was in August when we started working on it. Uh, we started, you know, with the basics, looking at what some of the other exchanges had, mm -hmm. and then, you know, seeing where we wanted to improve upon that and getting, you know, the fundamentals in place. Uh, we first started with things like the matching engine and the order gateways that would gear towards API trading. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, interested uh, us in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then we rolled out things like the website on top of that. And mm -hmm. once we had enough of the components in place that we felt comfortable, we launched. Okay, so um, in three months, that's like a major achievement. And you, you started this with a partner, right? right? A Correct, and yes. And what's his name? Vadim. Okay. Cool. And so, but now you're pretty much running it kind of on your own? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Cool. And so, um, Bitfloor is, uh, it still has low volume. It's not, it's not the most well-known exchange out there. But one of the things that brought me back to you, besides having already you know, met you and known you, is uh, I was reading about, uh, about it and that you had open sourced the matching engine. And uh, coders were saying that it's like the best one out there, that it's, you know, it's really professional because you have, what, what's your background? Uh, before I started working on Bitfloor, I had worked in uh, automated trading. Um, it was a proprietary trading shop that did high frequency automated trading. You mean Forex? Uh, we did uh, all sorts of, yeah, all sorts oh. of things. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so, so it wasn't just Forex and, you know, equities, commodities, anything oh. that, you know, you could connect to electronically oh, could okay. be traded. Yeah. So trading shop is, uh, the, is a, a software development shop? Is that what you um, mean? Or? It's a combination of different things. There are software developers that work on the libraries mm -hmm. and the fundamental, you know, kind of system that connects mm -hmm. to the exchanges to consume market data, to enter the orders, all those nuances of understanding the specifications. Uh, and then it's also comprised of the traders and the quants, you know, that will come up with the algorithms that will work with developers, uh, which can sometimes be the traders and quants themselves, to actually implement their ideas mm -hmm. and then trade on the markets, hopefully with the goal to make money. 
Do you mind if I ask how old you are? I'm 25. I guess, I guess you don't mind because it's too late, I already asked. Yeah. 25, okay, so you, you just talk completely over my head, I have no <laughs> idea, I'm like t more than twice your age, but like you young guys are blow my mind with, all, with your experience, and how do you get so much experience in that field when you're only 25? Um, I wouldn't say that I have that much experience, but it's one of those things where, you know, it can seem like a walled garden if you're looking at it from the outside, mm -hmm. but once you kind of work in it a little bit and you kind of understand like where the strings are you know, being pulled and what some of the technologies are being used, you know, obviously as with anything, you become kind of more familiarized with the space that you're working in. And so then it, you know, yeah. will seem like you know a lot, but yeah. there's still always a lot to learn. It helps if you're very bright to begin with, and then you I just suppose that immerse helps. yourself in it. Yeah, I suppose, right? So, all right. So coming from this uh, trading shop background, then you you had this coding experience. Were you actually coding there, or uh, working on other people's code, or? Uh, it's always a combination, combination. of both in okay. development. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. a software developer, mm -hmm. so you know I would have the job of working <coughs> on. Uh, the systems that would connect to the exchanges to consume either market data or to be able to place orders, update the libraries that you know traders would then use to write their algorithms on top of. And I also worked with traders to implement some of their algorithms. So, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit cool. of everything. Cool. And you know, one of the things that I love most about Bitfloor is its simplicity. That less is more. You know, the, some of these sites that are so glitzy, they look like uh, I don't know. You know, <laughs> like moving ads and visuals mm -hmm. and stuff is just crazy. Too many features, too many scrolling marquees and nonsense garbage. And what I like is Google.com from the old days. You know, just search. You know, and like real, real simple. Like that Preev website, p r e e v dot com. Mm -hmm. I love simplicity. That's where it's at. You know, less is more. And Bitfloor, I love that. It's it's really it's just very straightforward. It's got you know your overview, and it's got your transactions, and then it's got your market data, right? And add funds, withdraw funds. That's it. Mm -hmm. Speaking of add, adding and withdrawing funds, um, the uh, so it right now uses Dwala. Dwala only. So what's your, um, what, do you, what do you tell people when they ask you, you know, for other options, other ways to get funds in and out? Um, people have asked about Paxum in the past. Uh, I told them that we would look into it. Obviously, that's no longer an option given mm -hmm. that Paxum doesn't work with Bitcoin companies mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. um, some other options that we've, you know, considered, BitInstant, um, other things like Liberty Reserve, um, ACH directly, you know, taking those. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly a lot of that has been put aside just to keep it simple mm -hmm. and to you know, help kind of manage our risk. Uh, yeah. With dealing with US dollars, obviously you have the risk of chargebacks and you know, just the whole anti-money laundering you know, regulations you have to follow. Mm -hmm. And so the less we can expose ourselves to you know, potential attack vectors mm -hmm. and you know, kind of simplify our dealings with US dollars, mm -hmm. the better. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm we've been hesitant to, you know, kind of add new things without properly exploring them. Right. So Paxum, for those of you who don't know, Paxum recently has announced, right, that they're, they, or they're closing uh, their dealings with any business that does business with Bitcoin. So um, that's kind of closing that venue. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen with Dwala because Bitcoin, I think, is a huge per percentage of Dwala's uh, overall transactions. Yes. Um, and then... Um, the other on oh, bid instant in uh, a, oh, ACH like direct ACH I can see that being a huge problem because that's obviously that's just chargebacks you may as well just take checks you know or even worse credit right. cards right. or PayPal that can be reversed six months later mm -hmm. you just charge it back months after the fact 180 and, days yeah yeah uh, yeah that's you know well actually they can even I, I've heard of cases where like uh, credit cards and PayPal can even up to six months later. It depends on the ter specific terms and stuff. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so um, uh, BitInstant is good, but then that kind of, uh, it works real well, but it also opens you up to another venue of having to deal with the US dollars directly, and that makes sense. So right. Dwala works for now. I mean, mm -hmm. they have, there is that uh, Dwala Instant service they have. I think it's a maximum of $300 or something like that, but you can apply for that where, so that they can at least put money in instantly and then, you know, then they settle back on the end. Do you know how that works? Yeah, uh, no. Dwala basically extends you a line of credit. Mm -hmm. You apply for it and they're basically giving you a line of credit for 300 bucks. And so I say instantly send it and they instantly send it. And then the six calendar days that it takes to get it out of my account, 
they're it's just they're extending a loan to me mm -hmm. until the money is pulled in. So there's like I think it's three dollars a month or something like that they charge for that service. So mm. you know, as long as you only need three hundred dollars right. at a time, it seems like a good idea. I don't know. I don't know anybody who's actually. I, I know a couple who have applied for it, but I, it, I guess it takes yeah. some time to get approved. But anyway, you know, so whatever. If it's they say two to three business days with Walla, but sometimes I've seen it be like five or six calendar yeah. days. Yeah. So it has to do with, you know, if you make a new Dwala account, it'll take some time for those mm -hmm. initial first deposits. So you verify that yeah. account, then it'll take some time for the ACH to transfer. And it's just, yeah. you know, kind of part of the US the ACH, you know, banking system. Yeah. But, you know, that's kind of how it is. But once you get in, past some of those initial hurdles with Dwala, mm -hmm. I found that, you know, it's pretty reasonable mm -hmm. to move funds in and out. Yeah. I mean, the last time I did it, it was six calendar days. And I already had an established account. So this mm -hmm. is like after that. So, so those of you who are setting up a Dwell account initially, you know, account on is like I, I would call it calendar days, not banking business days. I'd give it five days to set it up and another mm -hmm. six days to do the transaction each time you do a transaction. But you know, it's cool. One mm -hmm. good thing is that when you put money, like if I take money out of an exchange into Dwella, I can send it right back out. Yes from Dwala to Bitfloor without having to wait because it's pretty much instantaneous as it comes in and goes right back out. Yeah, that's what I would recommend for people if you know you're gonna be, you know, using funds between several exchanges or, you know, it's not a one time I just need to convert some BTC to US dollars or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Just keep some in Dwala, you know, mm -hmm. um, the, an amount you're comfortable with and then just have that so that you don't have to incur the, like you said, six calendar day wait time just to yeah. trade $10 if that's what you want to do. Exactly, yeah. Well, and then the bid instant, I mean, what do you call it? Uh, the Dwala instant service would yes. come in handy if it's only $10. Right. Anything less than 300 so that's pretty cool. Um, let's see. So the, uh, about the matching engine, is that the part? I've talked to developers because I'm not really, I'm not a developer <laughs> anymore. Way back, way back in the day, a little bit. But um, I've talked to developers who say what's needed for Bitcoin is a high frequency exchange. <laughs> so would you consider Bitfloor a high frequency exchange? Um, Compared to the other exchanges, <laughs> I would consider it a high frequency exchange and I'll kind of outline why, um, mm -hmm. why I think we can do more, a higher frequency than the others. Mm -hmm. Compared to real stock exchanges, obviously we're nowhere close. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that kind of makes us different than what I've seen implemented um, and from what I know looking at the other exchanges is that our matching engine is run entirely in process, um, in memory orders, everything. Uh, it doesn't have to hit uh, a database to look up orders. So a common thing I've seen with some of the other exchanges, I can't speak for all of them, just a few, is that when you send an order to their, you know, let's say their order gateway that receives your order, mm -hmm. um, they will put that order into a database of orders, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and what will happen then is they have another process, or maybe it's the same process, that will look at that database periodically or be told that, hey, there's a new order, and then it'll see what orders it can match. It'll pull orders from that database, see what else it can match. Mm -hmm. For us, we don't do that. We accept your order at our order gateways. We mm -hmm. you know, make sure you have the proper accounts on, you know, in your, the funds the in funds. your account. Mm -hmm. We put them on hold if necessary. Mm -hmm. And then we will send that to the matching engine, uh, which has all the other orders in memory, and it will be able to very quickly perform the match or you know, reject your order or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it will send that information out to the rest of our system, mm -hmm. which can then relay it to you or write it to a database mm -hmm. on its own time. Mm -hmm. So all of that happens kind of with these independent components uh, that can allow us to scale in, in different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. um, that's so, what makes our matching engine a little different than some of the others potentially. So the, because it's componentized, would you say, it's like modular, so the matching engine is its own function <laughs> Uh, it's separate and then so that in other words in other implementations like all of it has to happen in one process and and by separating it um, the writing to the database and sending it to you and all that can happen later so that the, the real high-speed part of it happens 
uh, separately? You could summarize that it like that. It mm-hmm. doesn't, for other implementations, it doesn't have to happen in one process mm-hmm. because they are writing to a database and then pulling from the database. They mm-hmm. could have separate processes. They could have a matching engine that kind of also acts partially in memory reading from a database. Mm-hmm. But since we already have checked your order on income on the incoming gateways, mm-hmm. we can you know send it to the matching engine and the matching engine doesn't hit databases. You know It doesn't do any complex logic, it assumes the orders it's getting mm-hmm. have already been vetted and mm-hmm. are okay to be executed against. Mm-hmm. So they'll be tagged with your user identification, they'll be tagged with the amounts and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if they can be executed, they will. If not, they'll go on the order book. Mm-hmm. Uh, that type of system also allows us to scale out the front end gateways a little better. Mm-hmm. So instead of having just one entry point for users to enter in orders, Mm -hmm. we can have different ones that can all talk to the same matching engine Mm -hmm. um, because they all have a common way to communicate. So as the demand grows, you can you can scale that out and and correct larger and larger. Yes. Can the matching engine be scaled that way or is it a single point that uh... the matching engine as we currently have it Mm -hmm. is a single a single process Mm -hmm. for each type of product. Since mm-hmm. Bitflora only deals with BTC USD, there is mm-hmm. one matching engine. Mm-hmm. If there were multiple currencies or different products, there mm-hmm. could be a matching engine for each one mm-hmm. so as not to slow down the mm-hmm. other matching engines. Right. So again, we would not be using a shared database for all the matching engines. We could, you know, have mm-hmm. one matching engine, you know, either potentially fail and not affect the others mm-hmm. or just work completely independently. Mm-hmm. With the database setup, you could also scale it out differently. You could have different databases for different products, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, it's manageable, mm-hmm. just not quite the same. Mm-hmm. Is there is there a standard way to measure the speed of uh, processing ability of the of transactions with um, exchange software? Orders per second that you're able to process um, would be the biggest thing, just how many orders clients can kind of input Mm -hmm. and how many the matching engine can crunch, things like Mm -hmm. that. Uh, Mm -hmm. Something we do at Bitfloor um, that I don't believe I've seen at any of the other exchanges is that we send you back timing information. Uh, Mm -hmm. So when you get your order status or order confirmations, they have the timestamps from when the exchange, specifically the matching engine, Mm -hmm. saw your order. So you can begin to get information about your latencies, you know, maybe Generally, you have very low latencies. You're able to get orders in and get the responses quickly, but then you know every once in a while it spikes or something bad happens. Mm-hmm. And to again, high frequency trading and to automated trading, this is very important to understand when these things can happen and kind of be able to manage that um, because order you know the execution speed matters. Right. Um, to you know just a day trader or someone that just wants to exchange their bitcoins because they heard about the cool new thing. It doesn't matter, but to someone running a bot, it definitely matters. Mm-hmm. So we provide that type of timing information. Hmm. So okay. So have is there have you done any benchmarks? Is that something that's done, like to benchmark the, the maximum? Like it is to- absolutely something that's done. Uh, I have not benchmarked against some of the other exchanges. We have a rough idea of how many. Um, requests per second like our matching engine could handle Mm -hmm. in like bulk. Um, We don't know exactly how many it could handle like at peak or in one spike, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But we have a ballpark of around 2,500 to 3,000 probably requests per second on the back end matching engine. Mm -hmm. Could maybe do more with a little optimization, but that Mm -hmm. hasn't been a problem yet, so. Okay, so now, uh, what happens if it exceeds that? What if you got 10 times as many at the same? Uh, it depends. There are different things in the pipeline that could fail, um, as with any exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, what's nice about our setup, again, different from some of the others, is our website, our matching engine, our order gateways are all very independent processes. Mm-hmm. So if our website goes down, this does not mean that trading operations stops. Mm-hmm. The order gateways um, can still continue to operate as we look into maybe a website issue. Mm-hmm. Likewise, if an order gateway goes down, we can have backup order gateways and mm-hmm. the website doesn't go down. So all mm-hmm. of these things um, help kind of mitigate that. Mm-hmm. So to answer the question about what happens if you get flooded, it really depends um, how seriously you're flooded. And you know, to some degree, you'll start to drop orders. Maybe you'll start to reject orders. Mm-hmm. Um, to another degree, you can have a queue a backlog of orders. Um, We haven't been flooded, but one thing to consider if you do get flooded um, is that I believe uh, orders should be tagged with time to execute so that 
if let's say you know you sent an order and for some reason the exchange is backlogged mm -hmm. and it's been so many seconds or something like that you should be able to not have that order execute yeah um i don't think other exchanges do this we currently don't provide that feature either mm -hmm. but with our system it would be easy to implement mm -hmm. and that would allow you to kind of mitigate the risk of a backlog so that mm -hmm. if the exchange is experiencing problems you don't have to be executing orders um, in a delay mm -hmm. and the reason that's a problem is because if you're executing orders delayed you may not know where the market is trading right. and so you may not be getting the you right executions skill. you want the mm -hmm. right deal things like that so mm -hmm. it's important to always know where the market is when you're trading can the could and is that the, the the matching engine that would actually I mean like can it keep uh, a queue of and say once I'm, I'm like at 90% of capacity just start, automatically start rejecting orders um, the matching engine could definitely do this. Uh, various things could could do it, mm -hmm. but the matching engine would be kind of the last step of the puzzle. Like I mm -hmm. said, if the matching engine accepts your order, mm -hmm. that means the order has been put into the matching engine, stored mm -hmm. into its state, and we will honor that order until you cancel it. Mm -hmm. So if the matching engine has confirmed that it has received your order, mm -hmm. that it means it has written it you know, mm -hmm. to disk, recorded that it got the order so that we can recover in case of disaster, mm -hmm. and you know, your order will be honored. Okay. And we have all of this logged so that you know, if there are discrepancies, we can look at it. Yeah, wow, okay. <laughs> Have you ever had to do that? We have not, no. Okay. The systems, you know, knock on wood, have been mm -hmm. really good for being mm -hmm. just, you know, made by two people and run uh, on their own. Yeah. Um, again, we haven't experienced high volume, so mm -hmm. part of that is not having experienced the really high volume that, like, yeah. Mountain Gox does. Mm -hmm. um, but I still feel confident that it would hold up to mm -hmm. good volume. Mm -hmm. I'll have to put it to the test. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Okay, so now tell us the, the big announcement that is happening today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now that we've so, got all, the, all that basic sure. knowledge out of the um, way. So going back to what lets us scale and something that makes uh, our, the way our system design interesting is I can drop different types of gateways in front of the matching engine. So historically, we have had a... Uh, HTTP REST gateway, which is similar to other exchanges. They provide a, you know, kind of a single um, endpoint where you just send the order and, you know, you can query for order details, you can query for your account information, but really you just kind of send the order and then you can figure out if you have fills later. Mm -hmm. And this is all right for the, you know, getting the exchanges going to write a simple trading bot. You can do this. Mm -hmm. It's very simple, but Something that has been lacking has been a gateway that allows you to connect and get your fills streaming in real time. Um, so this is you send an order mm -hmm. and let's say you know it's able to execute immediately. Mm -hmm. You want to know that you got the fills and you got the execution right away or mm -hmm. when they happened. Right. Um, and that has been lacking at the exchanges. So what I have done at Bitfloor is developed a fix gateway. Uh, FIX stands for Financial Information Exchange, and mm -hmm. it is a standard used very widely in the financial industry for connecting to trading platforms, exchanges, mm -hmm. and placing orders and getting fills back and getting that information in a real-time manner. So, mm -hmm. you know, starting today, Bitfloor will have a FIX gateway that traders can use to connect, send their orders, and do their trading. So they will use uh, a fix compatible software that will be their front end to interface with Bitfloor? Is that how, is that how yes. it works? So fix allows, uh, the great thing about choosing fix is because it is a standard, there mm -hmm. are many, many off the shelf solutions that a trader can use. Many trading shops, like proprietary trading, like where I worked, any banks, things like that, will have you know, in-house knowledge of how to connect to FIX endpoints. Mm -hmm. Several exchanges provide FIX gateways. Mm -hmm. um, there are free libraries, there are paid libraries, um, lots of different tools that you can use, GUI tools, non-GUI tools, um, that traders can use to connect to a FIX gateway um, however they see fit. Mm -hmm. So providing it, um, you kind of piggyback on all of that existing knowledge and that industry standard that you know, many people already know how to use. So someone coming into, you know, Bitfloor, or sorry, Bitcoin trading from a existing trading operation mm -hmm. uh, might be familiar with FIX. They won't necessarily be familiar with your custom, you know, REST API, right. but with FIX they will be familiar 
and they'll know how to connect to it. They'll know how to how it should operate, how to you know speak the fixed protocol essentially. And they already have the tools in place to do it. Exactly. So we got to do a press release and send it out to the whole trading community and say, guess what? You can do it with Bitcoin now and yes. only at Bitfloor. Yes. As far as I know, <laughs> there's no other exchange uh, that is providing a fixed gateway wow. right now. That is cool. Now, one thing just to clarify. Um, you know, for uh, like a lot of people in our audience are obviously they're not experts in this, and mm -hmm. um, including me. <laughs> and so, um, when you talk about real time, like you putting put, place, the user puts in an order, and then getting real time fills the mm -hmm. data coming back. I mean, <clears throat> an average user might say, "Well, I can get that on the other exchanges because within moments they see the order being filled and they they get that information." But that's what you're saying is that's after the fact. That what you mean is like instantaneously within microseconds. Correct. Is that right? Yes, I okay. do literally mean it could be microseconds. Um, that's probably what you'll see on Bitfloor. On mm -hmm. real exchanges, it's even faster. Mm -hmm. um, but the difference is that when they enter an order and there's fills, what they have to do is they have to query for order details again to see if there are fills, which oh. means they have to perform another request, has to go through you know any validation the order gateways have to do, mm -hmm. things that their order gateways have to do as well as ours, um, and then they get that information back. And that those for gearing towards high frequency trading again, mm -hmm. uh, those you know delays those you know seconds even or half a second could matter between mm -hmm. you know placing the next order or not. Mm -hmm. um, so with a fixed gateway, it's connection based. Mm -hmm. uh, with REST, every new order, um, every new request is kind of its own connection. Mm -hmm. It stands alone, independent of all the others. Mm -hmm. With FIX, you connect to the gateway and you maintain your connection for the lifetime of the session and you can you know, send orders, you can get the fills immediately and act upon those fills. Let's say you got a fill for an order you know, that was only partially, you can cancel it, you can place new orders. You can do these things much quicker now than you could with the REST gateway. Another interesting thing the uh, fixed gateway allows you to do is send in orders kind of like in a streaming fashion. Let's say you want to send several orders really quickly back to back. You can do that. You can also send the cancels quicker than you can with the normal you know, rest endpoint. Because so, you're connect, yes. you have a connection. Yes. That sounds like, is it resource intensive on, this, on the BitFloor's side of it? It's not really more resource intensive than the existing order gateway that we have for the rest. Really? Um, it is a little more resource intensive in that we have to maintain state for the connections mm -hmm. and you know we have to keep track, we have to make sure you're connected. Um, another interesting thing we have at our fix uh, gateway, and this is pretty common to see at others, is cancel and disconnect. So if mm -hmm. for some reason, so let's say you've connected, you've placed 10 orders, mm -hmm. and for some reason your connection is broken, you lost internet or something, this can be potentially you know, a dangerous situation because mm -hmm. you're trading, trying to you know, yeah, essentially right trade on the market. Yeah. So what will happen is our fixed gateway will automatically cancel those orders for you. Everything. As yes. soon as you lose connection, it cancels everything. Correct. It will cancel only the orders you've placed through the fixed gateway. Mm -hmm. If you continue to place through the rest gateway, those orders it doesn't know about, obviously. Right. But everything you've placed through the fixed gateway, as soon as you disconnect, it will cancel for you mm -hmm. um, if it can. Obviously, if an order has already executed because someone else beat you to it, mm -hmm. you cannot. Yeah. But if it can, it will cancel, which kind of, mm -hmm. you know. Mitigates the risk of losing your connection. And, yes, and exactly. And this is important because people who are, so let me, let me make, make sure I understand mm -hmm. too that, so these, um, this fixed protocol is something that all kinds of super sophisticated trading software is designed for, right? Am I right? And they can, so they have these fancy interfaces and, and data analysis of what's being filled in real time. And it's, are there bots that are built on that too? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, where I used to work, we would connect to many fixed gateways. There are many, you know, other proprietary trading shops. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, fix is a uh, standard, well mm -hmm. recognized and used by several exchanges. Mm -hmm. So there are many like people that write bots, write libraries that can speak fix, um, mm -hmm. and you know, will handle a lot of the session issues mm -hmm. for you so then you can just deal with I want to build this this order mm -hmm. or I want to know when I get a fill. Mm -hmm. uh, Bitfloor mm -hmm. itself um, uh, to write our fixed gateway we write on top of an open source fixed library that we are you know heavily contributing to and expanding mm -hmm. um, and that's available on our github page okay. um, at github.com slash bitfloor mm -hmm. and you know others are welcome to use that to write trading bots to you know connect mm -hmm. to a fixed session and to not have to worry about some of the intricacies of the fixed protocol 
and just you know do what they want to do, which is the trading. Yeah. You know? It sounds like uh, one of the results of this, am I right? That one of the results of this is going to be a lot more arbitrage. If it, it doesn't take that many bots, that many traders <laughs> uh, to keep the you know to do arbitrage between the other exchanges. So it sounds like the um, the the price on Bitfloor is going to much more closely uh, reflect the price everywhere else because of this. Is it, would that be? A um, it could be. I think one of the biggest challenges to doing Bitcoin arbitrage currently has been moving the uh, fiat currencies like U.S. dollars mm -hmm. or pounds between the exchanges, and that's why you don't really. That's why you can see what looks like really good arb opportunities, mm -hmm. but not everyone is taking advantage of them because mm -hmm. it just is kind of painful to move the other currency between them. But Dwala um, works for that, doesn't it? Like you get, but it, does it still it does. take a day or? Um, I don't know. Uh, Dwala, I think if you move into Dwala and then back the other exchange, it's minutes. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, sometimes the arb can close up. Mm -hmm. I've been pretty happy with the spread on Bitfloor. Um, mm -hmm. It's been. Sometimes it's been as close as one cent, mm -hmm. which is our minimum allowed spread. We have a mm -hmm. minimum tick increment of one cent. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, it opens up to 10 cents depending on where the market is at. But yeah. even for low volume, I've been pretty happy mm -hmm. with what the people trading on Bitfloor have been doing. Yeah, that's good. And I, I like uh, the one, th if I'm interpreting it properly, you tell me mm -hmm. because uh, when I look at the market data and I see, you can you can see the um, you know the spread right, mm -hmm. and when I hover the mouse over the ask price, I can drag it up that line and it tells me the total liquidity or something. It looks to me it looks like if I'm going to spend two hundred dollars, this mm -hmm. is the price I'm going to get. Is that right? Like if I would was. have to spend two hundred dollars to get this price. Are you talking about the charts or on the home page? The charts. Yeah, the charts. I believe um, the chart will show you a uh, summed amount, so yeah. it will take into account how the um, you know the size yeah. at that yeah. level, yeah. and then the price of that level, and then if you wanted to essentially consume that mm -hmm. level, you could pay that, that amount. Would be right. yeah, yeah, that's so important to, to me. <clears throat> it's so basic. Mm -hmm. Like when I, I have a, you know a friend, and I'm, and they're mm -hmm. like, well. You know, it's different if you're buying one dollar or two hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. You're going to pay a much different price. Yes. And so, just to be able to hover the mouse up until I get to five hundred dollars and say, okay, at five hundred dollars, this is going to be. Would that be your average price, or would that be the high price? I guess on the chart. Um, if you're looking at the chart, mm -hmm. I don't remember the nuances the of the chart, side, but yeah. <laughs> it would depend on how much is before you. Yeah. Um, it would probably be the high price. Yeah, You'd I have believe to go it would. Up to that price, yeah. at that dollar amount, yeah. See, what I want, what I want is really simple. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it later. Maybe sure. You know, play. But what I want is, I, I mean, super, super simple. To say, I want to buy a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, and then have it tell me the average price you would pay mm -hmm. based on the order book. Now, I see. Just so simple, little yeah. calculator. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to get Bitcoin charts to do it, and they kind of did the reverse. They're like, well, if you bought this many Bitcoins, it would cost this many dollars, mm -hmm. but. That's not how people do it. They, they don't say, I want this many Bitcoin. Usually, it's the other way. They say, I have $500. What would be the price right now? Okay. Um, so if I type in 500, kind of like pre, like it, it should adjust in real time as mm. I type, you know, like age action. Yeah. So that like I type in $500 and it will say that's going to be 398 per Bitcoin. If I type in $1,000, it's going to say, you know, 407. So I can kind of play with the numbers, maybe, you know, maybe even a chart or somehow, but so that you can see, like, Okay, I should buy this many. That I should mm -hmm. buy, maybe not a thousand. I should buy eight hundred and sixty mm -hmm. because at eight hundred and sixty, I'll get a much better price than a thousand. Does it, that make sense? It does make sense. <laughs> and one thing I'll say, you know, without kind of going into too many details of how trading, how you can do basic trading or anything like that, is <laughs> it really depends on your end goals, mm -hmm. what you're trying to accomplish. If you just have, you know, a hundred dollars and you need bitcoins right now, no matter what, you don't really care, mm -hmm. and you just want to do that. You just can put in an order for a very high, you know, price and yeah. just do it for a hundred dollars cool. and get the bitcoins. Yeah. But if you're really looking to kind of slowly acquire them and want the best, you know, price, yeah. you sometimes it's not in your interest to kind of do one order. Sometimes it's in your interest to look at what the inside of the book is, which is the best bid and ask that you can get, mm -hmm. kind of take that order. Mm -hmm. And then wait to see if someone else will come in and kind of you know step into that fill, position, fill right? In, yeah. um, so you, like the sand is coming down the side of a hill, and you just exactly. grab some, and then more will fill in. Exactly. And grab some, and then more yes. will fill in. Yeah. Um, so this is obviously um, this will, if you are mm -hmm. patient, this can net you a better mm -hmm. average price in the long run if the market doesn't move while you're doing it. Obviously, yeah. the danger with 
all of these things is that as you eat away, nothing fills in. So the spread widens and the market is moving event essentially. Yeah. But obviously on average, you'll do better that way than if you just, you know, Putting dumped a thousand dollars, one big order, you're going to essentially, and this has happened on some of the other exchanges, you're just going to wipe out the book. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. this, you know, it's a very real thing. It can happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you won't get the best price, but again, if you don't care, it doesn't matter. If you matter. want it, you need it, whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's kind of where, I guess that's kind of, Basically, the chart as it is kind of fills that purpose because you, you see this valley here in the middle, mm -hmm. and then on the right hand side is the asks. And if I just hover, I can see the price, and as the price goes up, I can see okay, well, this is about the price I want to pay. Yep. So then I, that's 167. So I can just put in 170, $167, and I know that I should get about that price. Yeah. So it kind of helps for planning yeah. if you want to play that little game but yeah exactly like, that yeah. does that all the time if, yeah. you was, if you were doing it for sure <laughs> several yeah several users um have asked about kind of an auto fill in for the price uh, mm -hmm. or it's sort of kind of simulate a market order if you will where mm -hmm. they don't really want to take the time to compute they just the yeah. price that they should um trade at they just need n number of bitcoins and they just want to do that mm -hmm. immediately um and that's something we're looking into doing. You know what I would love? <laughs> Here's another feature that's maybe stupid. There's actually three features I can think of I want. One is, tell me if, if this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Like literally, a, a big green button and a big red button. And a green button that just says, buy mm -hmm. all my dollars into Bitcoins. That's it. I want my dollars to be zero. Mm -hmm. Just buy. And buy all, you know, buy entire, at whatever, just like do it. And then a red button that says sell, sell mm -hmm. all my Bitcoins for dollars, just like, boom. And it just automatically does it. I know that you can obviously, you can, obviously you can put in an order for, well, see, you can't though. Like I can't put in a, an order to buy a million Bitcoins at $20 a Bitcoin Correct. because it's going to say insufficient funds. Correct. So now I got to get out my calculator yes. and do the math backwards. It's like, yes. no, I just want to hit a green button and say, buy all my money into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So that I want that feature. I think that could be a reasonable feature, um, given <laughs> if you just had an okay step or something. Yeah, right? as long as it pops up and says, right. "Are you sure?" Yeah, exactly. Are you sure you want to to spend all your dollars into Bitcoin at the current book? You know, yes, I'm sure. Something that's kind <laughs> of the differentiating factor here. Um, so another interesting thing. So while we're talking about kind of web interfaces and web, the the trading interfaces, mm -hmm. at um, so I haven't seen this at the other exchanges. Maybe they've added it since then. But with Bitfloor. We have like uh, in the trading interface online, we have a grid view, like a table that will list all of your active open orders, right. and you can expand them to see the fills and the fees you've incurred. Yeah. Kind of a very intuitive interface to get a complete overview of your trading history, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of this was designed with the idea of kind of a novice to, you know, kind of capable online trader. Maybe mm -hmm. that's why we don't have you know a giant big green button yeah. or a giant red button. <laughs> But right. certainly that is an important thing we want to also begin to cater to is kind of a novice user coming mm -hmm. into it that does want a lot of the math and a lot simplicity, of this, this, yeah. this simplicity. And so we may like, you know, either Doesn't simplify. It be a giant green button. Just sure, green exactly. Button. <laughs> yeah. So it's really just deciding on who we're targeting with what type mm -hmm. of interface. Um, and even, what type of tools to give them. Even a capable trader sometimes just wants mm -hmm. to buy $100 worth of Bitcoin yep. and just buy it without having to get out their calculator. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> of course. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one good... See, like on other exchanges, they'll allow you to exceed your funds, mm -hmm. which is weird, and then it just keeps the remainder in an, in an open somehow in an in open order. Mm -hmm. but uh, So I can actually put in, buy a million Bitcoins at $1,000 a mm -hmm. Bitcoin, and it'll do the same thing as my little green button idea. Right. But then the remainder shows up in the order, but then I still have to go down there and, and click cancel, because if I don't, then it's like a permanent green button. Yes. that will always be... So that's not perfect either. But really, I just want a one-time only click. Are you sure you want to spend all your dollars into Bitcoin mm -hmm. at the current market you know, order book? Yes, I'm sure. But right. And, uh, and then this the opposite, obviously. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would like is basically like an, uh, a checkbox so that I could have it automatically do that. Mm -hmm. So that for, and I'll tell you the use case for this. This would be really useful for a merchant. If a merchant has um, a fear of currency risk because they want to receive Bitcoins, but they mm -hmm. want to convert it into dollars right away because yep. they're charging $12 for a cheeseburger and a shake and they need the $12. They can't take any chance that they're getting them at $5 today mm -hmm. and then tomorrow it's back to $3. Right. So um, they need a button that's a, a check mark that says mm -hmm. auto sell 
um, always auto sell every Bitcoin that hits this account. I would love that because <laughs> you know it has to be real visible. It should be actually be like like the auto reply on Gmail where it's like a visible banner that says you have this set to auto sell, mm -hmm. cancel now. You know so that it's like there. But it's a setting so that they could just leave it and go and never have to mess with it hmm. again. They they only have to go in to withdraw the dollars if they're if, like for example if all they're using it for, like they can actually take their Bitcoin address for uploads to Bitfloor mm -hmm. and make that their merchant's yes. Bitcoin address. Yes. Then every Bitcoin that hits that address is auto sold and they don't have to worry about hmm. it. It's one less step for them to do for every right. transaction. So that's the other thing I'm gonna. That is interesting, and we can. About. <laughs> that, I, I like that. Um, again, it's completely possible because of. Uh, essentially, the website and the trading features of the website act as just another gateway. So now, you know, we at Bitfloor, we essentially have three order gateways, three different types. We have the REST API, we have the FIX uh, order gateway, and the website. And, you know, the website can be this place where it gears more towards novice or towards a merchant type of setup where it can provide some of these features. Um, and as long as, you know, you're being notified of what's happening with your account, yeah. I think it would be reasonable. Um, because the last thing we want to happen is, you know, for things to accidentally be flipped or right. to, you know, what you didn't intend to happen. Yeah, it has to be um, very, the language has to be very yeah. clear and are you exactly. sure and all that. Yeah. But, they, but these could be, they, they don't have to be obtrusive and they don't mm -hmm. have to interfere with those capable traders. Right, <laughs> exactly. that's the thing. They're completely, you know, they're very independent systems yeah. and it's easy to kind of add on to the website a feature that would do that. And as long as it's been okayed, you know, it'll just it'll make the records that the orders happened and things like that. Mm -hmm. you and know what a REST IP, what, what is REST? Um, REST is just a, um, I wish I could remember API what the acronym, is the yes, REST API. API. I yes. know what an API is, but what's REST? REST uh, is a certain type of API? Yes, I forget what the acronym stands for, mm -hmm. but it essentially is over HTTP, and it means that there is no... Um, like state in the connection, oh, okay. um, essentially. You can do a request and get the response back from the server, mm -hmm. and that's it. You and it like, Unlike the fix where it's connection. Every single yes, transactional exactly. Like yes. Oh, okay. okay. It's yes. like at rest in between. <laughs> sure, you could think of it like that, yes. Okay. Yeah, and this is what's very common with all the other Bitcoin exchanges. Okay. Yep. So, like, if somebody developed an Android app for Bitfloor, Bitfloor mm -hmm. Mobile, right? yes. then um, would it it, would it use the fix gateway or would it use the REST? It would probably use the REST API. Um, a mobile app would probably use the REST API because with mobile, obviously, you have the problems of losing the connection, the connection all the time. All the time. Uh, it would, and again, with mobile, you're not looking to do the type of high frequency and the immediate right. you know, feedback necessarily. Right. You're really just looking to place an order and have it be out there or kind of look at your over account overview mm -hmm. and all of those things you would do with a REST API, not a fix API. Yeah. Cool. Or a mobile website would be equivalent, yeah. It should be easy enough to create a mobile app. You know, they should they should actually create like a universal mobile app that would work with multiple exchanges. Um, it's know? possible. A lot of the exchanges do have very similar API kind of layouts. Um, there are some libraries out there that can, you know, I believe there's some PHP, some Python libraries that can talk to different exchanges. So. The same thing would be done, you know, on the mobile space. REST is very simple because essentially when your browser is, when you've loaded a website and your browser is talking, you know, showing you the content and everything, it's also speaking REST to the server mm -hmm. um, or over HTTP. Um, so that it's, it's all very, it's all hmm. kind of the same thing. Very cool, very yeah. cool. So have you talked to uh, any of your uh, contacts in the... Uh, trading space about uh, and, and told them about this or has this been high not yet now? Um, the fix gateway we just launched today yeah that's um, what I mean. it's available on the test net now um, for just wide testing and will mm -hmm. be on the production um, network within the next few coming days once I feel kind of happy yeah. with where test net is mm -hmm. and get some users actually interested in it yeah um, and then I guess I can, you know, the goal is to spread the word and let some people in the industry maybe know that this is mm -hmm. a possibility um, and that there is an exchange mm -hmm. out there with fixed connectivity. You're letting them know right now. Exactly. They're watching. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they'll be checking it out by the time they're watching this. By the time they're watching this, it'll probably be... Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's definitely ways. running on testnet and this mm -hmm. is where, you know, regardless of what type of trading you're doing, REST API or FIX or anything, I recommend you always start testing your things on our testnet. It's like fake money, uh, fake a, US that, dollars. The same site, but you can you can 
what change play dollars for fake bitcoins? Is that what the yep, test net exactly. is? Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't you, see that on the site. Um, it's, maybe I should is make it a, a little more known. It's not even a setting. Oh. If you go to the uh, API documentation mm -hmm. at the bottom of the page, it talks about how to test your bots. Oh. Um, this would be really for testing bots. It and this is through the API, not through the web interface? Uh, through the web interface oh, as well, yes. Oh, There's okay. a, so the test network mm -hmm. is a, just like the Bitcoin test network. It's a completely separate box, mm -hmm. completely separate setup, and okay. it's an entire clone of the production network. So everything you can do on production, you can do on testnet. The testnet API is just testnet.bitfloor.com. Okay. Um, we'll get you to the testnet web, you know, web mm -hmm. interfaces mm -hmm. and to see how many fake dollars mm -hmm. you have. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I recommend all users start there just to make sure they can connect properly, that their systems and our systems are doing what they expect before moving to real money on the real production network. Right. Maybe yeah. I did see it. I just didn't. I knew what it was. Yeah. And I didn't, it's only wasn't. it's only mentioned in the API section because as a normal just web front end user, you wouldn't care that this kind of exists. Right. But if you're working on APIs, you will want to know how do I test it yeah. without incurring losses. Right. <laughs> and the test net is for that. Right. Cool, yeah. cool, cool. Exciting. All right. Wow. Well, we're getting the word out about the fixed gateway. Yeah, definitely. All right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited about it. I think it's uh, uh, my goal and belief is uh, that it provides a little more kind of legitimacy to what Bitfloor is trying to accomplish, which is right. provide good APIs that people would be familiar with and that, you know, would provide the things, the API resources they need. Mm -hmm. um, so not just kind of throwing together any old API, but actually thinking about how other real exchange, you know, when I say real, I mean like NICE, NASDAQ, BATS, how they do APIs, what terms do they use, and you know, what are the characteristics of their systems, and then trying to bring some of that over to Bitfloor and its APIs. Um, we document everything on our website. We, you know, I try and be very thorough with the documentation and what each API call does. Um, I, we provide example libraries, example bots. Uh, we don't want people coming to our exchange and then just having to hunt around everywhere else to find the documentation. Mm. We want it to be very clear on our own website yeah. what the exchange supports and what our capabilities are. Right, right. Yeah, so. And if people send you an email, you actually get it right away and read it and reply. Yeah, I'm kind of an email <laughs> junkie. It's like I, a uh, miracle. Yes, I get the emails to the phone, as a lot of people do, and I, mm -hmm. I try and reply um, at least with confirmation that I've gotten their email. Mm -hmm. uh, most emails, like I said, because we've been low volume, have been really simple, either mm -hmm. a request or a recommendation, and you know, I thank them for that or address it and things like that. Do you ever get an email that's just like... like uh, what what is Bitcoin and why should I use it? Yes, <laughs> you yeah. do. I do get those Forward every those once in a while. For those yeah. to BitcoinMe.com. That's <laughs> yeah, and definitely yeah. Bitfloor is not necessarily the place to you know start as a complete <laughs> novice. We try and right. redirect people to other sites. Yeah, um, like BitcoinMe.com to mm -hmm. learn about it. Like I said, mm -hmm. you know, our goal is more from the trading aspect. Someone that yeah. is looking to trade, make a market, or just exchange some bitcoins and. Just, a little bit familiar with what it is. Cool. Yeah. So now after, after uh, this, after the fixed gateway, what's your next uh, major thing, under, thing you're going to undertake? Um, I think the next thing to pursue on the exchange will be to re-examine some of the web interfaces you talked about. And mm -hmm. some other people have alluded to ways we could clean it up, things here and there. Mm -hmm. um, not much has changed on our web interface. And I do want to kind of revamp that, make it a little more structured, mm -hmm. um, and build upon some of the good things there. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the next big thing. But just, you know, I promoting like simplicity, it. simplicity, though. Don't make it glitzy. Yes, exactly. We simplicity. do want to keep it very simple. Um, <laughs> uh, the whole experience should be very straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I'll, you know, is as volume begins to grow, I'll probably add things like uh, daily or weekly report trading reports for people that want them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, more important maybe for people running automated traders just to double check that things are kind of where they expect mm -hmm. or to download their order history in kind of a reasonable manner, which yeah. you can already do. We have a download your history link, but kind of make some of that more well known so that as people begin to do some trading, they can 
get these aggregates, you know, how many, how mm. much in fees have they, you know, done. Yeah. Um, that's another interesting thing that we did first out of all the other Bitcoin exchanges is we uh, differentiate between a liquidity provider and a liquidity taker. Oh, yeah, that's and right. And we provide a rebate for the liquidity provider. So, you didn't mention that. Yeah. So let me see if I get it right. So the, <laughs> the liquidity provider is the one who puts in an order that is, is not filled right now. They're, they're putting in a, a standing order, as I would call it. Correct. And they are going, okay, and then the, that's the liquidity provider. The one who takes that order and matches it is the liquidity taker. Yes. And the taker pays 0 0.3 is that I right? believe it's 0 0.3 or 0 0.4. I think it's 0 0.4. 0 0.4. I yes. remember the three because it's the difference. So yeah. 0 0.4. They pay 0 0.4. Yes. And then the other one actually doesn't get charged. They get paid 0 0.1. Correct. So their net, the net revenue, I guess, is 0 0.3. Yes. But you're charging one side 0.4. Yes. And you're paying the other side 0 0.1. Yes. Which is great. So you can actually do, do all your trading just by simply putting in standing orders and mm -hmm. you don't pay any trading fees, yeah. you get paid to trade. Yes. Again, that's, you know, it's geared towards it, you know, there's different reasons for doing it. One of mm -hmm. them is obviously if you don't care about what exact price you're executing or you don't need the Bitcoins now, right. you know, we encourage you to just fill out the order book a little. And part of that is an incentive the rebate acts as an incentive to kind of show your hand, if you will, mm -hmm. because now you're saying, I'm willing to pay this price for the, this amount of coins or whatnot. And yeah. you know that's giving other people more information to act with right. accordingly. So for that, you get an incentive if your order is executed. And a fuller order book just gives you a much clearer picture of what's, what's, yes, what's available, exactly. what's there, yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> if the order book's empty, it's gonna, right. it's, it doesn't uh, facilitate trading. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Exactly. Makes a lot of sense. Cool. Well, thanks. We've got to do this again for sure. When, you know, <laughs> yeah. Next major update. Yeah, exactly. The next yeah. major thing. Maybe yeah. the web interface, right? Yeah, yeah. for sure. I'll help you. I, I can... Uh, I can be the dummy for, this, for the dummies. Tester, yes. Yeah, the dummy, the usability, user, user testing. So, right. cool. Thanks so much, Roman, for joining oh, me. Thank you. All right, and thanks you guys for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Bitcoin Show. Take care.